I think it's better now. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's do take two. We'll edit it later. All right. Welcome to our live stream here from Autocrit. And uh, my name is Daniel. We're going to be starting a new uh, a new challenge this week, uh, and that is going to be our Character Connection Challenge, which I am so excited about because characters are one of my favorite things to talk about. In fact, uh, they are maybe one of the most important thing regarding writing books. Uh, I, I would actually argue probably the most single important thing in terms of writing fiction would be your characters. So this is something that I love to talk about. I get a lot of questions about. Uh, I often give a lot of comments about when you're getting uh, criticism from me when uh, I do my little critiques. Uh, I tend to really love to get into the head of characters and talk about characters. All right. So that being said, we have the character connection challenge. Oops. Why does it say deadline? Hold on. I went ahead of myself. Yes, the character connection challenge. When it comes to characters, one of the most important things that you can ask yourself is what motivates them? What are they uh, drawn to as a person? Uh, it's kind of like the old standard cliche that actors ask when they're doing a scene. You know, what's my motivation, director? Well, you essentially are the director of your own story. You've got to put all of that on the page. You have to put all that body language, all of those reactions. Uh, you you can't let the audience infer too much. You need to make sure that it's there, right? It's not the same as a script where a director is going to interpret it. Uh, you want to do a lot of your own interpretation for the audience. So you need to know what motivates your main character. Now, when it comes to motivation, motivation comes in a few basic forms. And for those of you who have taken some of our online courses at Autocrit, you know what comes next. Yes, it comes three forms, wealth, love, or meaning. And when I say wealth, I mean basically status. Um, you know, what's your social wealth or your economic wealth? Uh, and uh, love. Um can be all kinds of relationships. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. I know we're heading to Valentine's Day, so people are thinking about that. But no, it doesn't have to be romantic. It could be a friendship. You know, boy and his dog story is still could be a love story if that's the primary motivation. And then meaning stories. So meaning stories are stories where the character is on a quest to learn the answer to some very important question. Uh, perhaps it's something related to themselves. You know, can I do this? Or it could be related to the world. Why does this work this way? Right. Um, and the important thing for all of these uh, motivations is for them to be concrete. They really should be trackable to the audience. You don't want the character just to be abstractly like, ah, I wish I could be more meaningful to society. Generally, what they'll do is they'll come up with a way to be more meaningful to society. They'll have to win some sort of prize or accomplish some sort of feat. And that might be a little simplistic, but again, this is a story, right? We've got to be able to track it. Uh, if we can't track it, uh, what you end up with is such an abstraction of their motivation that we don't really know if they're closer to the goal of getting it or not. And that can be very challenging for us to really invest in. And so much of character work is for us to invest in the story. It is our window into the story. We relate to characters just like we relate to other people. And narrative is something uh, that we relate to a lot more than just raw information a fair amount of the time, right? Uh, and this also comes with reduction. Uh, this is an issue that journalists often have, have right? Because if they want to be objective and just tell the truth about a news event, it's very challenging to do that and stay interesting. Often what they'll have to do is take some sort of narrative perspective, which involves reduction and bias and all of those things, uh, just for the sake of keeping the audience's attention. Uh, you also find that opinion-based editorial commentators on the news tend to do better in terms of their views than people who don't. Again, because they're presenting the audience a narrative that helps them understand the world. The world is just too complicated otherwise. Well, it's the same thing with your book. You do not need to come into your book with some sort of like 
I'm going to attempt to be unbiased and study my characters as if you're like, you know, Jane Goodall studying gorillas or something. Like, no, you don't need to do that. What you do need to do is literally take a perspective, you know, take a moral perspective. And usually what you're doing is taking the perspective of the main character or the who's often the viewpoint character, but whoever's head you're in, right? And they are motivated by something wealth, love, or meaning. That is the primary thing that drives them in life. It's their primary focus for the purpose of the story. Again, you might say, well, that kind of flattens the character. But again, you're trying to give narrative purpose. And that doesn't mean that's the only thing they think about. That's the only thing you cover. But if it's the driving force, it makes them trackable and it makes them understandable. Otherwise, what you'll end up with is a character that's a bit of a cipher. You're not quite sure what they stand for or what they're doing. And that's not a very compelling narrative. Want versus need. So we talked just now about what the character wants. Well, what do they need? Does it have to be one and the same? Well, of course not. Do we always know what we need in life versus what we want? No. Uh, sometimes people are self-aware. Yeah, you can do that. You can have a certain amount of mindfulness or, or you know, self-analyzing you know, self ability that you can say, I know that if I were to get this, this would make me happy, right? Relative, you know, generally, uh, you know, this is what's missed. This is the void in my life that's missing. If I could fix that, I would be happy. But often we get that really wrong, don't we? <laughs> so you do need to keep that in mind. What motivates the character does not have to be what they need. And in fact, commonly... It is not. Um, uh, sometimes they'll get what they want and then they'll realize that it's not all that in a bag of chips and then they have to figure out what they need. Uh, sometimes they figure out what they want is actually bad for them. Uh, there's all different ways of unraveling that. But for the purpose of writing a scene, uh, you need to focus uh, your writing from the perspective of what the character wants. However, you as you know the god of your universe, you also know what the character needs. And whether or not they're in on that fact or not is kind of up to you. Sometimes as an audience, it can be very fun. Uh, romance relies on this a lot. A lot of the time, the romance genre is about we know who the character needs, and the character needs that person. That person is perfect for them, uh, but they might want somebody else because they don't realize that. And so that can be a lot of fun for us to watch. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. let's see here. Where does revenge fall? I, I was just looking at the comments. Uh, for a motivation, revenge, it depends on what the revenge is about. Because it could be that it's revenge in order to regain a relationship, in which case it's love. It could be revenge in order to reestablish your power in the society, in which case it's basically wealth. Or it could be revenge for the purpose of meaning, like you've learned something about the world, although I'm not exactly sure how you would do that. So it's probably either love or wealth. It just depends on why, why the revenge, right? If it's to kind of just restore justice, you know, and a sense of purpose, that would be a meaning story. Because what you're saying is, in order for me to feel like somebody who lives in a world that makes sense to me, I need to have this happen. So that's essentially, that's essentially a meaning story. Uh, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. I think that's fair. Again, it's rather reductive, but it's just for the purpose of, of filtering, right? Some of these uh, some of these tools are not an exact science because you're talking about human psychology. It's just like anything else, any sort of stereotype, any sort of uh, psychological classification. It's, it's going to be reductive. So fair enough. <laughs> revenge is the universal motivation. I mean, revenge can mean a lot of different things. It depends on the primary thing. However, I would say if you're doing a revenge story, you do want to figure out what, what is underneath that. I would say revenge is an outgrowth of a motivation more than a motivation in of itself. Ooh, I like this question. How do you handle it when your main character wants acceptance, but they're self-sabotaging? So that would be uh, the difference between knowing how to get what you want and uh, not, right? Just because a character, just because a character knows what they want, doesn't mean that their goal, uh, doesn't mean that the method they choose to get to what they want is correct. In fact, it's often not correct. It's 
Usually not, because if it were correct, if they started out, imagine you start out in life and you're like, I want to do X to be the person that, you know, I want to be, and you know exactly how to do it. Well, then it's just a matter of doing it. Now, sometimes the doing it can be very difficult, but usually what actually holds us up is not the doing it, it's the knowing what to do. It, it can be that for sure. So if it's, if, and the nice thing about the, or it could be, uh, we don't know how to do it, right? It, it could be one or the other. If we know how to do it and we just don't do it, then that just means we're not that motivated to do it. So that actually means we could be deceptive, deceiving ourselves about what we want, right? And there could be another factor. Uh, but with characters in terms of self-sabotage, it's there's multiple reasons. It's just like in life. Why do multiple people sab why do people sabotage? One reason could be they're scared of getting what they want because of the consequences, right? Uh, it could be that they don't know they're self-sabotaging, in which case you'll have a relationship character come in and explain, you're going about this all the wrong way. You want this, but you don't do it this way, you do it this way right uh so those those are some those are some ways to deal with that but yeah self sabotage is 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 kind of a, a man versus somebody said man versus nature man versus man man versus himself yeah those are all story plots however uh that's not necessarily the motivation that's just where the conflict comes uh and that comes to the antagonist which we'll talk to a little bit later and so that's a way to describe the different antagonists of the story <laughs> Why do people cheat on their diet? Um, well, that's a question depending on the person. It could be that they're not actually motivated for what they want enough to overcome the temptation of the moment. It's delayed gratification, right? Ultimately, they may want their health to be a certain status, but it might not be enough of a motivating. What that would mean is that the motivation of the pleasure of eating the food in the meantime is actually higher. Because if it weren't, then they wouldn't do it, right? <laughs> but that's not what they, that may not be what they need. What they might need is to not do that, okay? So yeah, it's important to, it's important to know. It could be that the character knows what they need and they're not actually acting that out, right? So yeah, that's possible. But you would know as a, as the author, what is motivating them? Somebody who's motivated to break a promise they make to themselves it means that whatever they're doing that's breaking the promise is really the motivation right now. So unless it's forced or something. All right. Difficult situations. One thing that's important to keep in mind with your characters is to put themselves into difficult situations in order to achieve what they want. This is called conflict, right? And in order for there to be difficult situations, it kind of gets back to the, the question of self-sabotage, right? They have to be in the state where they can't get what they want easily. Otherwise, they would have gotten it already. Now, how difficult the situation is or how it manifests itself is going to vary uh, based on the story. There's all different ways of writing this. But the ease, one of the easiest ways that you can establish a difficult situation is to ask yourself, okay, somebody who behaves like this, or maybe even this specific person who behaves like this, what would be the most difficult situation to put them in? And then kind of force that to happen. Uh, that can be quite compelling. Even if it's contrived to some extent, often uh, this will land well. Uh, what you'll find is that contrivances that make life easier uh, tend to go over very poorly with the audience. Contrivances that make life harder tend to go easier. And this comes from our sense of pessimism that we have as human beings. We're a lot more likely to believe a coincidence that worked out terribly than a coincidence that works out well, right? It's just, it's kind of our nature. And so when it comes to writing, you don't have to panic so much about, you know, if you establish that your character is claustrophobic and you're like, well, I don't know, like, uh, what am I going to do with that? Well, you should do something with that, right? You should put them in a situation where they have to face that or something similar, because uh, otherwise you're just leaving conflict on the ground and you're not making them work as hard for what they want as you could. And that's not going to be as compelling of a story. And again, you have to ask the question, if it's not that hard to get what they want, when did they have it from the very beginning? Uh, you know, what is the story even about at that point? There's no character growth or anything like that. But why can't this character is a great thing to ask yourself. 
you know, uh, the classic example I like to give is Dancing with the Stars. You know, Dancing with the Stars, the entire premise is based on people that cannot uh, or, or don't normally dance are being forced to dance. And that's the entire premise. And it's kind of fascinating. You get to see how they manage it, right? They're very good at lots of other things, but they're not particularly good at that. And that's the whole premise of the show. Um, I mean, there's other elements that are fun to watch, like the dancing, the costumes, the lighting, the music, all that. But that's the main focus of the tension. So keep that in mind with your character. There's what they want, and then there's something in between what they want, and whatever it is, it needs to be something that makes their life difficult. And in general, keep in mind that, you know, you want to make them work for their what, what it is that they want, because then it proves that it's really important. All right, so that brings us to the antagonists. Uh, I like to use antagonists uh, instead of villains because... What I'm talking about is the obstacle between the person is who they are and what they want or what they need, but particularly what they want, uh, because this is what's motivating them, right? So they really want to get something and there's something standing in their way. Now, this antagonist could be evil, like they don't want them to get what they want because they just don't like them or they're immoral, or it could just be it's something that's working cross purposes to them. It could even be somebody that has their best interest at heart because what they want is bad for them because it's not what they need. So this is something to keep in mind when structuring your story. Uh, don't always think of the opposing force as immoral. They may very well not be. They in fact might be more moral than the viewpoint character. It just depends on wants and needs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, to get past the antagonist, it does require the main character learning something or uh, changing, because otherwise, if they could just get past them in the first place, if they wouldn't prove to be much of an obstacle from the beginning of the story, why are they an obstacle in the first place, right? They wouldn't be. <laughs> so they need to be a true obstacle. Uh, they are not always a villain anyway, like Elsa from Frozen. Yes, that's a great example of an antagonist that is not a villain. Uh, the villain of that story is Hans, uh, who's a different uh, kind of character there. I call them the distraction character. They represent the wrong way to go about getting past the antagonist, right? Anna is the protagonist of Frozen. What she wants is love, particularly from her sister. But Hans tells her, well, you can just settle from love from just about anybody. And she doesn't even know what love is. So she, it's just like this impulsive, just I want to be with you and spend time with you kind of thing. And uh, she's willing to go for that. And uh, and uh, Olaf is the character who explains, well, no, love is self-sacrifice. It's putting the needs of somebody else above your own. And so when she learns that, she's able to save Elsa. And then Elsa is able to learn how to love. And that solves the problem. You can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Well, if you try hard, right? Isn't that how it goes? If you try hard, you might get what you need. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's the point, right? You've got to you've got to work at it, right? Uh, to get what you what you need. Um, <laughs> I'm not like an expert Rolling Stones fan, but hopefully that's correct. All right. So, what are some of the different characters out there? I talked about the antagonist, right? The character that you might be at odds with. If you try, sometimes you get what you need. That's what it is. Okay. I made it. I made it a little bit more difficult than that. See, I was trying to make it into my narrative. Okay, but yes, if you try, you do have to try. It's effort, at least. Uh, <laughs> but I thought it's you might get what you need. Somebody look that up. I'm pretty sure it's you might get what you need. Um, is self sacrifice always an element of love? I would argue, in the classical sense. Yes, true love is outgoing, unselfish concern for another individual, which usually involves some bit of self-sacrifice. It's not just the other person likes me for exactly who I am. There's usually an element of giving up a little bit of yourself on behalf of somebody else. Um, but that's, I mean, that's at least what Frozen is presenting as a definition of love. That's its moral viewpoint. Again, I come back to, you don't have to take this unbiased scientific high level approach, you're going to take an attitude and frozen creates that attitude that true love always involves putting somebody else's need above your own. That is the viewpoint it takes. If you disagree with that, fair enough. That just means you have a different worldview than the writers of frozen. I happen to agree with the writers of frozen on that one, but you know, uh, 
your mileage may vary, I guess. <laughs> All right, skeptics. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Yes, you can't always get what you want, but if you try some times, well, you might find you get what you need. I knew it. I knew there was a little bit of, of, uh, of doubt in there. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I, I think that's true. You know, you, you try, you have to try and that requires getting past an obstacle. Okay. So I talked about antagonists, the obstacle, who are some of the other characters involved? Well, there's the skeptics, the skeptics or, uh, the opposition character. There's usually a central one is a character that is in place just to tell the main character they're not going to be able to do it. And I don't mean just as in that's their only purpose. I just mean that's their primary plot purpose. They're there to tell a main character, I don't think you're going to pull this off. Or I'm not even sure if what you want really matters anyway. And so in which case uh, they're very helpful to have around. One way they're very helpful is that if a main character can win over a skeptic, what it shows the audience is what they want is worth working for right? It's like, it's that good that somebody who starts the story being like, that's not worth it at all. It's like, yeah, okay, I see your point. Or the other thing you can tell the audience is that, wow, the main character has gotten so much better throughout the story that this person who didn't like them at all is now on their side, right? So skeptics can be very helpful. And then of course, what it also can do is it can put doubt in the audience as to how the main character is going to accomplish what it is they're seeking out to do, which increases the difficulty level, which is increases the tension. And this is all fantastic to do. A foil for the audience. Sometimes, sometimes this helps you avoid like the Mary Sue or Gary Stu problem where the, the main character seems too capable is if you have somebody pointing out what they're terrible at, and it needs to be true to a certain extent, or it doesn't really land. Can skeptics be foreshadowing? Yes. Of course, skeptics can foreshadow. They can say, I think this is a terrible idea. And then it turns out that they're right. It is a terrible idea. Yeah, the main character was not ready. Fair enough. All right, friends. What I mean by friends are the supportive characters. Now, friends can be, somebody said here, my main, my character's best friend is a skeptic, some tough love. Yeah, you can have a friend that's kind of a frenemy in that sense. Uh, they're, they're, they're on for the ride. They're supportive of the main character, but they're kind of like, you're really not going to be able to do this. But okay, I guess, you know, that's fair enough. But you can also have characters that are just that extra boost, that shot in the arm. Now, this tends to take the form a little bit more of wish fulfillment and can give the audience a little bit of a rest from all the tension. If you're doing this properly, your main character is really going to be put through the ringer, right? Throughout the story. Uh, and so you need a couple of things along the, ro the road. That means the main character isn't facing all of this on their own. They're not getting, they can't get zero encouragement because if that were true, well, they would just fold into a, a million pieces, right? Um, we can all speak to times in our life where we felt incredibly isolated and though that generally we didn't get a whole lot done during that time frame uh, because we felt like, who cares? You know, you tend to get a very detached attitude, which is why um, having interaction with other people is so important. So you can have a goody two shoes cheerleader person in your story in a sense. And this can be very helpful to have. Don't think of this character as so flat or unnecessary that you just kind of get rid of them altogether. Another way they can be helpful is that they can turn on the main character and this can create a, tr a dramatic pivot and really make the main character feel like their back is against the wall when you want to do that big pit at the end of your story. It could be that along the way, in order to get what they want, uh, they have to make moral compromises and their friend who starts out totally on their side has to say, no, I don't like you anymore. You become a bad person. And then they have to have a epiphany and change. And uh, when a really close friendship can shatter in front of your eyes, this can be excuse me, this can be a very compelling way of handling that pit. It works really well. It's kind of the inverse of the skeptic. And so uh, uh, I really recommend uh, thinking about friends and how you use them in the story. Don't neglect them. Uh, you know, sometimes the sidekick sort of role can feel boring. You know, uh, one thing to keep in mind though with the sidekick is what can help them from getting too flat is if there's something that's motivating them besides the fact that they just really like the main character. If all they care about is the main character's happiness, that seems a little bit short-sighted, right? I mean, even in our closest, most intimate relationships, we generally want more than just the happiness of our 
significant other, right? Um, we 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 have some self motivation, right? So you know, it could be their primary motivation is the happiness of the main character, and that can in fact happen, uh, particularly if this friend is really a romantic relationship, which I put in the same category when it serves this role. Um, uh, but that may not be the only thing they care about. And it could be that that's not even the primary motivation. They're along for the ride uh, because their motivation is working in harmony with what the main character sets out to do. So it could be that because the main character will achieve what they want, that the other character is going to achieve a side benefit that's not, you know, it's, that's correlated, it may not be directly tied in, but it works well enough that it helps. And then they can be that, yeah, go for it. You can do it because they're somewhat selfishly motivated. Uh, and that can uh, seem more realistic in some ways. I love this. No one has to see any movie they don't want. I refuse to see The Godfather. Watch what you enjoy. Now let people tell you to watch. I agree. Um, if I mentioned an example, don't take it as necessarily even like some sort of ringing endorsement. I just tend to bring up examples that are uh, works that people know really well. <laughs> uh, going back here. Uh, da, 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 da. No pure altruism in humanity. Wow, Jack. So skeptical. So skeptical. <laughs> but again, that could be a worldview that you're presenting in your fiction. Nothing wrong with that. If that's true. All right. What about the uniqueness of relationships? How do you get across that this relationship is interesting? Well, one way is to lean into the uniqueness of it. I just gave you kind of some overall kind of ties between people. You have protagonist antagonist right somebody's an obstacle we have somebody is just kind of an opposition we also have somebody is a friend or an ally but it's not just as simple as that like i was saying in the last one you know there's often more going on underneath the surface there's subtext uh, there's other things and the uniqueness of that tie is what can keep it from feeling too stock too two dimensional uh think about uh what like I said, what is motivating both your main character and this other character they're having a relationship with? Uh, even if you understand the mechanical purpose that other character is playing, uh, give them, put some meat on those bones, you know, give them a personality, make sure you it's earning its spot on the page, that there's there is an emotional reason why they're doing it, that it's not just you as an author is like, I want this person to be a big skeptic because I need a big skeptic in the story. No, why are they a skeptic? Were they betrayed in the past? Are they nervous about the future, et cetera, et cetera. And the uniqueness between the two, you know, there's so many stock kind of relationships that seem like something you've seen a million times uh, with these dynamics. Figure out a way that this relationship is a little bit different. Uh, we all have seen people, you know, they have very loving and close relationships with their uh, spouse and there's a uniqueness there, right? The dynamic is quite different from couple to couple, and yet they can achieve a lot of happiness. And so keep this in mind when you're writing, you know, your own relationships. Don't uh, just fall back on, well, it worked in this other book like that. No, what's specific about your version of this relationship? What about the characters make this different than normal? Somebody who has had a major betrayal in the past is going to treat a relationship differently uh, than somebody who doesn't really know what dishonesty looks like. They've just lived a very privileged life. It's, it's going to change it, right? A skeptic and friend combined equals encouraging and supportive, but setting expectations. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, when I say skeptic, I don't mean that they're just evil or they don't they're not helpful or they don't even encourage to some extent an example of a skeptic like is han solo in star wars who isn't just there to just crab on everything and just thinks everything's awful but he just often takes the approach of you know i mean can we really pull this off is this really worth doing and he does evolve over the course of the series but certainly in a new hope you know the big moment is when he comes back and luke has won him over and it's that big stand up and cheer uh, moment Making characters like baking, you need a dessert. Cool. Throwing sugar on a plate does not a dessert make. You need all the ingredients to make a cake. Love that analogy. I always love cooking analogies, partly because I love food. So thank you, uh, Sharon, for that. All right. Now, when it comes to writing these scenes, which is what you're going to do as part of this challenge, it's important to establish subtext. Uh, in real life, when people have relationships, 
there is a ton of subtext. And that's because we generally do not like speaking to our feelings, uh, particularly because we're concerned about how the other person's going to interpret it. We try to be diplomatic, uh, all kinds of things. Now, some people like me are maybe a little unusually blunt, but for the vast majority of people, uh, you know, they find it very uncomfortable to confront people about different things, uh, even things that are hurting them greatly. And so what they'll try to do is hint at it or they'll just cope with it in different ways. So keeping this in mind when you're writing is very helpful, especially for newer authors. A lot of new authors uh, want to just spill everything out as if everybody is either a psychotherapist or they're like some sort of a brutal comic or something. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean coming in here with that ugly shirt on your face? You look like it's great. You know, um, sometimes people will talk like that, but often, no, you, you need a certain relationship level. You need a certain dynamic in order for that to take place. Otherwise, it's not very realistic. It comes across as phony and effective. Or, like I said, you can end up with the psychotherapist sort of approach where uh, somebody is like, wow. You know, that person was staring off into space. Clearly, they were thinking about their betrayal they experienced 10 years ago as a result of what, and that's like, okay, the viewpoint character wouldn't know all of that, right? They wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to infer all of that from what is going on. It's like, boy, you're, you know, you're just kind of putting in all of this subtext is text, right? Instead of just showing us a wounded person, showing us somebody who suffers from distrust or things like that, which will end up as a character that just spits it out. I'm a psychotherapist, so I, be so I better be careful. Um, no, I mean, right. I mean, actually, that's to your advantage in terms of writing, right? Because you would know how people tend to communicate, right? Which is not very much at all. Um, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but, you know, generally speaking, one of the number one things that a therapist will do is to get you to communicate your feelings to yourself and others, because it's very difficult for us to do. Um, not everybody. There's some people that need to, to not do it as much. But for a lot of us, that's the case. And so uh, keep that in mind when you're writing as well. You know, don't put all of that on the page. Subtext is text. Yeah, you don't want your subtext to become text, or it's not subtext anymore. It's just text. Uh, now, this is a good question. Does this mean you have to write in riddles? No, I do not believe that whatsoever. The idea is that you can give us the subtext in a way that is clearly what you mean to the audience. It's just not there on the page to each other. What I mean by that are something like, dialogue, right? In the dialogue, if I ask a direct, if a character asks a direct question, like, well, what do you really feel about me? And they say, oh, look, there's a tree over there. Well, obviously they're dodging the question, which probably means the answer is somewhat negative because why else would they do that? You can do all that subtext just from that, right? However, that's a lot more realistic than the person being like, so tell me, what do you really think about me? And the other person's like, I hate your guts. That's not often as common of a response. It depends on the level of the relationship. So just because you're writing subtext, because you're not saying it, you know, in the text, you're not saying, I hate your guts. You're just writing in the text that they're changing the subject. It's going to be pretty obvious to the audience what's going on. So what I don't mean is subtlety on the level where we can't tell what's going on. I just mean how it tends to manifest itself in human behavior. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about when I talk about subtext and reading between the lines. Relationship dynamics too. Yes, having four daughters who the current group consists of change the behavior of each person. That is correct, right? We all have people that we self-censor around for various reasons, right? They are troubled by certain topics. Uh, we might feel like we're offending them. You know, if you're, if you're on a, if you're uh, going out, let's say with your friend who just had a horrible, messy divorce, you might not be as lovey dovey with your spouse in that situation because you might feel like, well, you're just stabbing and twisting and flaunting your wonderful relationship when that other person is suffering. Right. 
On the other hand, if you have another couple with you and they're all being lovey-dovey, well, you might be lovey-dovey in order to kind of show them that, no, we're lovey-dovey too. And you might even end up in some sort of weird kind of subtextual com competition where they're like going for things and you're going for things and you're almost like trying to show off who's the better relationship. And you can do all of this without anybody saying it out loud, right? So again, whoever, uh, I forgot the name of the person who said you're a cycle therapist, you could probably have a lot of fun with this because you understand how these things tend to manifest themselves. Did you walk on my clean floor? Yeah, that's a rather uh, rather aggressive uh, sentence there. It's interesting to meet people who never self-censor. Um, I don't say I never self-censor, but I will say I do tend to censor less than most, um, which is not always a great thing. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, first impressions also known as the working title of Pride and Prejudice, a great uh, book about interpersonal dynamics. Um, first impressions uh, are really fun to write uh, because you can almost do how, you can do things however you want. You can have the first impression be for whatever reason, the people are really clicking. All the subtext is coming through. They really understand how it is that the other person thinks and operates. There's not a lot of misunderstanding and it just works. And generally speaking, this happens because the two characters are going to get along. But not always. Sometimes you have a really good read on somebody and you know you're going to hate, like, hate them and you know that they're no good for you. But often I would say you're, you know, that's probably going to be harsher than it needs to be and you need to find nuance. Often when you really click with somebody, you can really get inside their head. It's because you think similarly enough and that means you're probably going to make it work. But you get to decide as an author what's going on. Are these characters completely talking past each other? Do we understand that they're talking past each other even though the characters are not? So many great opportunities. Now, another thing you have to keep in mind is this is the audience's first impression on a character. So you have to be careful in how you present it. If the first impression of a character is that they're a horrible jerk, and it turns out they're actually a nice person and you're just catching them in an off moment. Well, unless the idea is that the main character needs to have this sort of experience, kind of like Pride and Prejudice, uh, this is not going to work all that well because it's going to be hard to get the audience to overcome that first impression. Uh, on the other hand, like I said, if you're writing something like Pride and Prejudice, this works really well. Well, on the flip side, if the, first, if the first impression you have the person is that they're this wonderful, magnificent remarkable human being and it turns out they're a horrible person well that's going to either feel like a betrayal in the story from the viewpoint character or it's going to feel like you're just not being consistent or you just decided as an author yeah that person's horrible uh the going back to frozen this kind of happened in frozen the first impression we have of hans is not particularly negative it might be a little bit weird but uh he completely does a flip at the end and people either like that or they didn't because they're like, well, that wasn't very consistent with what they wrote up to that point. Or you could just decide, well, he's a sociopath. So that's okay. Of course, he's not consistent. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's like, well, that's not very, that's not very likable. You know, that, or that's not very enjoyable for me as an audience member. It just depends. But first impressions are a great opportunity to write dynamic scenes. And that is what you're going to be tasked to do for this challenge yes your prompt for this challenge is to write a 1000 word scene which you could be like a thousand words that's not even a complete scene maybe not um that's fine if it doesn't have a conclusive ending uh that doesn't necessarily preclude you from winning keep in mind though at the end of the contest uh, we are going to read these out loud so i would say you need to at least have a little bit of a punchline or something to kind of end it but the idea is that these are two characters that have never met before OK, and we are going to, by the end of the scene, have a sense of the dynamic that's going to develop. And you have a you have an opportunity to write whatever you want. I'm not saying you have to make this a meet cute for a romance. You could do that. This could be a rivalry, right? Like the old school uh, sports movie where it's like, I'm going to get you. And oh, yeah, you know, it could be that um, it could be a friend of me situation. Uh, you the, whatever you want. You pick whatever dynamic. And if you're a little bit 
Um, not sure of which one. Well, next week we're going to go into more detail about some of the different character dynamics that you can have. We talked about some of them this week. We're going to go into a little bit more detail and get the most mileage out of them as possible. In fact, that's going to be the whole premise of this month. So if you have it, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, because that's what we're going to be talking about on these live streams. Characters. I certainly hope you have enjoyed the comments so far. And if there are specific things that you uh, deal with with characters and you'd like to know more about, you know, like you, uh, you struggle with, comment below, you know, let us know what it is that uh, you uh, would like to hear about. Some of the things you struggle with. Happy ending? Totally not necessary. Nope. However, I would say, you know, if both characters die at the end, I can't imagine that you're going to win. That doesn't exactly fit the prompt. The idea is that this is the first scene and that we'll want to read more after. Like, it's kind of the promise of, oh, this is an interesting start. This is the start of a hot and steamy romance, and I want to see what happens next. Maybe they don't even realize it yet. Maybe you can tell that it's kind of bubbling under the surface and you're just waiting to hear what happens. Maybe this is a great rivalry and you want to know what's going to happen when the fireworks fall. That kind of thing. Only your best friend will tell you that you don't self-censor. Oh, I've been I've been told that I don't self-censor very well by lots of people. Don't worry. In fact, I took a, took a psychology test, an ocean test, and it said that I rank in the zero percentile. Like nobody is less polite than me uh, because of how blunt I tend to be. So there you go. Which I think is kind of an asset when it comes to being an editor. Uh, but I do try to weigh that when I do do my editing comments. Uh, because on the other hand, I rated very high for compassion. So I care a lot about you. I'm just not worried about offending you with what I think needs to be said. Which I guess is kind of a good thing. I don't know. You get to decide. LOL. Love it. Tammy is very similar. We get along very well at the clubs. <laughs> Oh, good times. Good times. It's a great community. It's a great community. All right. Is predator prey a relationship? Kind of a fear at aggression relationship and the mood writes something scary. Yes. Two characters. Okay. These just have to be sentient characters. They do not have to be humans. Right now. Uh, they need to have enough of a personality that you can see the dynamic, but no, they don't have to be humans. If you want to do a relationship between somebody and their toaster, fair enough. How you're going to come across with the dynamics of the relationship that's up to you perhaps you would find that to be a fun challenge it's only a thousand words sure make it work right <laughs> i prefer someone straightforward everybody says that until they meet somebody like me who's extremely straightforward <laughs> but i'm kidding i'm kidding I do have, I do have my friends, <laughs> a, a unique few. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, yes, maybe, oh no, I'm sorry. That's something else. Two robots. Yes. Wally. Beautiful relationship and Wally, right? And they barely talk to each other. It's all done through body language. So absolutely. Um, yes. Two characters. That's all I care about. Um, I don't want two abstract concepts unless they are characterizations of the abstract concepts. So if you want to have like, I don't know, freedom and liberty having a relationship well they need to be personified in which case too i'm not sure how the audience is going to go for that remember the finalists of this challenge will be read live to an audience so you're not even trying to please me try to please me to get to the last to get to that last live stream because i'm going to vet the material up to that point but at that point it's up to our audience can there be only two characters in the whole scene I would say you don't have to only have two characters in your whole scene. However, if you're trying to get across a great relationship in a thousand words, you might not want to have more than two characters in a scene, particularly ones that play much of a part. But no, if you have like people in the background or if somebody else makes a comment, that's not going to disqualify you. However, uh, you might not want to have a ton of other people just for the purpose of it might not establish all that much it might start to get distracting and honestly it's a good challenge for yourself uh to think of it from that standpoint just kind of close in on it you know uh particularly if you're not good at writing dialogue this is a great opportunity to force yourself to write almost a dialogue only scene if you tend to lean on dialogue too much try not to have almost any dialogue you could write a thousand words with no dialogue at all and get across uh, a relationship right Use the challenge for yourself. That's the purpose of these challenges. We're not just doing them for the sake of doing them, right? We love doing them and I love reading and all of that. We're doing them to challenge you uh, to make yourself a better writer. So 
don't just do the base rules. Put some more rules on yourself for the purpose of the exercise, right? I just didn't want to limit you too much on this one, uh, particularly because we had a lot of rules uh, last time. Is it just a scene or entire story? Does it start at the beginning? It's up to you. It's a thousand words. When I say scene, I just mean you could have multiple scenes in a thousand words, but I don't recommend that because that's going to be rather choppy, right? I would try to stick to one scene. I would say, in fact, if you find yourself not easily writing a thousand words that is a single scene, you could have a problem where you write too short of scenes in general. A thousand words with no dialogue, that sounds difficult. Well, then maybe you should do that. Just saying, try it. And if anything, you can decide later on to incorporate some dialogue, but maybe start there. It's up to you. Um, again, doesn't matter. If you have no dialogue in your work, you can make it to the final. If you only have dialogue, if all your work is is just comment, 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 you know, quotations, I will, that's not going to disqualify you either. This is very open. Uh, what I'm going to be looking for specifically, like I said, the prompt is two characters. They haven't met before. By the end of the thousand words, I know the dynamic and I'm curious to read more. That's it. Somebody says it might be a screenplay. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, but this is an exercise. This is not <laughs> This is not something that's meant to be a finished product that you're necessarily going to sell on Amazon or something like that. Can you do single sentence paragraphs? Well, you're probably going to do that anyway, Tammy. So you might as well. <laughs> Just saying, okay? You like bluntness, you said. Um, I, I do love Tammy's writing. But yeah, she, she. if you think Andy Weir, if you think Andy Weir is really tight with his uh, paragraphs, you should read Tammy's writing sometimes. Because it's like, woo, I just got to zip through there. <laughs> Ouch. I mean, it's fine. It, it's effective. It's a, it's a style. I'm not, I'm not, I do see. Yeah, I'm not, not knocking it. It's just a style. Twists. No, no twist. This is it. This is your prompt. I know. If you're disappointed that you're like, well, that's not going to be that difficult. Well, if you're an AutoCrypt Pro member, we will have additional challenges in the author community. Keep your eyes peeled on those. We'll do little pop-up challenges that will give you prizes. Uh, so those will be fun. And those will include more quirky twists. So if you, you like the whole quirky twist thing, uh, go into the AutoCrypt community and uh, you'll enjoy that. No twists. Nice. There's always a twist. Not this time. The twist is there's no twist. I know. I pulled a double twist on you. <laughs> And no, I'm not going to like pop up and be like, ah, I fooled you. There's a twist. No, there is no twist. So you can really refine these a thousand words if you want. Uh, you could just turn them out and keep moving. It is up to you. Bring your own twist to challenge. Yes, I would recommend do it for yourself, right? If there's something you're like, this would make it extra hard. Why not? Why not try? Uh, this is something that, again, should challenge you. We want you to become the best author you can as a result of this challenge. So whatever will make it most effective to you. No twist in two weeks. No, no twist ever. Okay? I'm telling you. No twist. <laughs> Don't be disappointed when there is no twist. All right. Deadline. Great relationship does not mean a good relationship. No, what I mean is that it's well-written for the purposes of the exercise. Correct. Uh, you do not need to make this a positive relationship. If you want to make this the beginning of a horrible rivalry, you do it. Never met equals total strangers? I would say yes, because uh, I, I think otherwise that's not never meant. Um, so yes, I would just make it a clear no. They don't know this other person. What about an auto crit writer's desk requirement? No, not for this challenge. Nope. I know. You're like, oh, freedom. Freedom is scary, though, as an author. So be careful with all that freedom. If you decide you need some uh, restrictions because you can't get over a writer, a writer, a block situation, just let me know because <laughs> I'm happy to do it. So what's the deadline? The deadline is going to be the end of the month, February 26th. So you got lots of time on this one. Look at that. Um, and like I said, we will be exploring character dynamics uh, throughout this month. 
So you might go back and because of some of the things I say, decide you want to switch things up. That's kind of how I want you to play with it. Don't think of it as a twist, but think of it as opportunity to go back, rewrite, edit, refine, et cetera, et cetera, based on some of the advice you're hearing, some of the courses you're taking, uh, which speaking of which, you might take the chem chem character chemistry workshop. Um, if you uh, would like to find out more in depth about different sort of ways of creating positive and negative relationships, I'm going to go into the nitty gritty, the hardcore details, lots of uh, specific advice, concrete advice. Um, it's going to be really fun. Uh, sign up there down below, Character Chemistry Workshop. There's two of them, Love and Hate. You can take one or the other or both. Uh, and they're going to start next Thursday. So each Thursday leading up to the final of the challenge. If you have not registered for the challenge yet, it is free to do so. Character Connection Challenge Registration. Yes. Uh, please uh, sign up. Uh, it is free to join this challenge. You do not have to be an Autocrypt Pro member. We will have additional challenges for our Autocrypt Pro members because... They're awesome. Uh, but uh, for everybody else, you can certainly join in the main challenge. Uh, it will not affect uh, whether or not you rank or anything like that. Uh, I don't even look at who submits anything. Sometimes I might be able to tell Sharon, or not Sharon, uh, Tammy, uh, because of your writing style. <laughs> Sharon somewhat, but Tammy, yeah, it's like, hmm, I wonder who wrote this. Um, but I do scrub that from, <laughs> from the initial uh, list, so that way I don't think about that while I'm doing it. So I won't know if you're a pro member or not when it comes to picking the finalists. So it's not going to affect whether or not you can win. In fact, I'm pretty sure the last winner was not a member when they started the challenge. They became a member throughout the challenge. Speaking of becoming a pro member, you can join some of our wonderful events like the Fantasy Club with all these wonderful people. Actual live screenshot, totally not something I made up, uh, of the Fantasy Club. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, story types in fantasy. So uh, there's a difference between genre expectations and the expectations of your specific plot. I'm going to discuss different plots and how they relate to the fantasy genre. We also have uh, the Horror Club. Now, the Horror Club meets on Wednesdays, typically at 6 p.m. The Fantasy Club meets on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. And tomorrow in the Horror Club, we are going to have Shocking Scenes, which is going to be Gareth discussing uh, some impressive, shocking scenes from Story, some of his favorites. Apparently, it's going to involve some spoilers so you know uh keep that in mind he's going to get into some specific scenes classic scenes in horror what makes them work uh and uh we have just launched our accountability club some of you are there yay I should ask you what you're doing yet, but it's only a day in but every week uh you'll be able to update us on what it is you're working on and then uh you can have us check in with you the next week uh, which is a great way for you to have accountability for yourself. It just means a, a lot when you know somebody is counting on you uh, to do what it is that you set out to do. And nice way to keep you on track. You won't have to do any of that yourself. We'll do that for you. After you do, you know, a few weeks in a row and you're accomplishing your goals, we can, you know, give you a big pat on the back. There might even be some prizes involved at a certain point. Just saying. Uh, we like to encourage all of you to be productive that is our goal here at Autocrit. So yeah, join us for the Accountability Club. We have it at 11 a.m. and uh, 8 p.m. on Monday. It's a good way to start off the week. All right. Well, that is the Character Connection Challenge. If you have not signed up, please do so below. Like I said, you do have to be an Autocrit Pro member for some of those events I talked about, but you can still stay subscribed to this channel, you know, and uh, get all the updates about the character challenge. You can also join us for the character challenge. If you haven't had a chance, you should go back to some of our former challenges, watch the live streams of the live reads. It's lots of fun. I get to be a little bit dramatic and do my little, whatever, audible impersonation <laughs> and uh, read them out loud, which is a lot of fun. And uh, you get to see the wonderful community we have, you know, exemplified in their artistic work. And I tend to be uh, so impressed with everything that they do. 
Somebody was asking, is accountability free? It is a service for our pro members. So if you're an AutoCrypt pro member, which means any level of membership beyond the free membership, you know, annual, lifetime, monthly, uh, those are all considered pro members. Uh, yes, you can attend the accountability club. It is not an additional cost. The only thing that I mentioned that is a specific additional cost is the... Uh, workshop and that's because it comes with a personalized author feedback uh which you know we only have so <laughs> there's only one of me to go around uh and so many others so you know we do have to be careful with how much we put that out as well however if you become a pro member we have opportunities where you can even give your work for personalized feedback uh in person uh and there will be sessions like that at the end of the month for fantasy and sci-fi so if you're not an autocrit Pro member, this is the time uh, to become an Autocrypt Pro member. It's a wonderful thing. You can see the comments. People love it. I love the community. It's great. Life for a year. Yes, of course. I haven't cloned myself a ChatGPT yet. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Daniel gives great feedback. Oh, thank you so much. And for those of you who purchased uh, feedback for the last challenge, uh, we did get a whole lot. So thank you. Uh, but that does mean we do have a little bit of a back catalog. We are working through it. A lot of, a lot of it is me uh, working through it. So just bear with us. We'll have it out to you uh, very soon. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Can you do more than one submission for the challenge? No, please don't, uh, just because uh, there are some people that are prolific enough that they would be able to submit like one a day and then we'd have like 30 of them and that's not really fair to the whole group. Um, I'm not saying that's you, Tammy, but um, I mean, you probably could. You write pretty quick, um, but no, um, you know, and then it's like, well, how many extra can you do but one? Let's just keep it to one. Now, if you do decide that you just get inspired and you write more than one, feel free to throw it into the author community, right? We have an author community on our homepage and you can critique your work or things like that. And uh, yeah, you can do that as well. Uh, prizes for those who showed up every day. If you are one of the people that's checked in every day in the author community, you should see your prize in the author services under my services. If you do not, please let me know. But you should see that. I believe everybody has been updated on that. And somebody did ask, is there going to be a daily check-in for this challenge? Uh, we're not going to do a daily check-in with challenges. We certainly, with this challenge, we certainly invite you to check in every day for that accountability. You can also join the accountability club, uh, but we will have uh, those additional contests. So if you're looking for additional ways to win prizes, we'll do those quick pop-up contest uh we'll do more of them this time around i we're gonna do one for every weekend um or other times <laughs> so for those of you who are on the weekend you'll have some advantage there'll, there'll be opportunities throughout the challenge for some fun little things all right got your prize for last month loving your prize awesome fantastic prize was there great 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 when is this due the end of the month the last sunday of the month before Midnight Eastern time. So really think of it as the last Saturday of the month, just for your own personal benefit. So you do not put it off until the last second. Love autocrate community and class has been growing a lot here. Other spots of class on the inter internet, not so much. Oh, well, I'm glad that we made things connect for you. I love giving people that aha moment uh, where they, uh, they're like, I've heard that a million times, but somehow it just clicks. That's what I love to see. Because I've been there. Um, that's one reason why I'm able to communicate it to you, right? Because I heard people talk about all these abstract concepts. And I'm like, I have no idea. And then one day it was like, oh. And so I hopefully can pass on that aha moment to you as well. All right. Fantastic. Yes. Great. All right. So once again, please like, subscribe, hit the bell. If you are here on YouTube, become an autocrit uh, member as well for some of these other uh, events. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in the community. Certainly looking forward to seeing uh, what you come up with for the challenge. Uh, fantastic. All right. See you around, everybody.